Welcome to the Online Great Books Podcast, brought to you by OnlineGreatBooks.com, where we talk about the good life, the great books, great conversation, and great ideas. Hey, this is Scott with OnlineGreatBooks.com. This week, we're releasing a podcast that Carl and Emmett, who are seminar hosts at OnlineGreatBooks.com, recorded with Xander and Eric at the Reconsider podcast. This show originally went out on their channel on May 21st, and they're talking about how long-dead philosophers are still influential and important to us today. So I hope you enjoy this show. Meanwhile, we are opening enrollment for a, I don't know what we're going to call this, maybe a little aperitif it's a, a seminar over the Mino. So for $9, you can join a seminar where we send you an electronic copy of Plato's The Mino. We send you your reading reminders and all your accountability stuff. Um, enroll you in our, our discussion community and our online community of readers. And then you get to attend a two-hour seminar where we discuss The Mino. And it's, I think it's one of Plato's most important works. We discuss the nature of virtue, the nature of... Uh, of memory and education, and there are a lot of other issues that are all discussed in this short, short dialogue. It's about 30 pages, um, but it's it's dense and good material. So go to onlinegreatbooks.com, go to join now, and you'll get a couple of options. You can, uh, you can either join our VIP waiting list, or you can join our Mino seminar. Join the Mino seminar for nine bucks. We'll send you your electronic copy and get to work with you. Meanwhile, go back to the show. Stephen Fry here. My new podcast series, Great Leap Years, is brought to you by our innovative friends, Hyundai, who, with the invention of Hyundai Click to Buy, made it quick and easy to purchase a new Hyundai in the same place you buy everything else, online. It doesn't sound like a new idea, but like all good inventions, it feels like it's been around forever. And to get my new podcast series, visit stephenfry.com forward slash Great Leap Years. Hello, everyone, and welcome to an Agora Podcast Network special. We've got a super special, in fact, special for you today. What we are going to be doing today is talking about the great philosophers over history. We picked three, so we wouldn't be here for six hours. And we're going to talk about why they're relevant today. As you guys know, Xander and I over at the Reconsider podcast, where we don't do the thinking for you, uh, really do love reading the great works of the past um, because they have so much to teach us, not only about our history, but about our modern world and ourselves as people. Uh, I will be moderating a discussion, and we have invited over to join us today uh, Carl Schutt and Emmett Penny who work with OnlineGreatBooks.com, where you can go and uh, subscribe to have a coached, mediated um, experience reading the great books of Western philosophy and thought. And uh, if you're very lucky, you will either get Carl or Emmett as your gadfly slash midwife slash Socratic interlocutor, <laughs> where you get to, um, you know, spend an hour a month, I think. Uh, two hours. Two hours a month. And I believe that that's the title on your business cards, right? It's gadfly slash Socratic interlocutor it, slash midwife. It will be from now on. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So you could spend a whopping two hours a month with them talking about your reading that you're doing with the group. Uh, it's a ton of fun, highly recommended. 
And my own little plug for it is if you go to onlinegreatbooks.com slash REC, you get a discount for Reconsider and Agora podcast listeners. So before we dive into our three great philosophers, Carl and Emmett, welcome to Agora. Yeah, glad to be here. Hey, thanks for having us, guys. So uh, we'll start with Carl. Tell us a little bit about why uh, you know why you joined OnlineGreatBooks.com, a bit about your background, and why you love the great works so much. Uh, well, I'll probably do that in reverse. Uh, I've been sure. striving. <laughs> I've been striving to get a classical education for a long time. I didn't know it. You know, when I was in college, I started out as an engineering major, and we used to make fun of the great books people. Yeah. They'd be on the quad playing hacky sack and smoking something or other. And, and, uh, we were engineers. We were serious people, <laughs> but, uh, uh, you know, it, it, it kind of bit me. And there I ended up later on, uh, getting a PhD in philosophy and just entranced by it. And, uh, you know, there's, it, there's so much that we don't have in an education, uh, that I, that I've been personally trying to get back to. Uh, and I happened to meet Scott Hambrick through another venture through um, Starting Strength Online Coaching. Uh, we both are strength coaches for them. And he says, Oh, cool. I love Starting Strength. Yeah. Well, said why? <laughs> Thanks. Um, but uh, uh, so he said, he, he found out, you know, that I that I had a PhD in philosophy and that I knew a little bit of Latin. And uh, he's hitting me up. Hey, Carl, we got to talk. And uh, well, he's an entrepreneur and he 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 starts businesses when he thinks he can and, and I'm not, <laughs> and I'm not at all. And he did. And, and here we are and we're, we're jumping in and it's been great so far. Um, at, so what was the third, the first, so I did him in reverse. What was the first question? Uh, actually you got it all. It was background oh, why you joined online great and why you love philosophy so much. So yeah. Emmett, okay. welcome as well to the show. Same questions to you. Yeah. All right. Um, let's see. So I think our first, uh, my background, well, the first time I ever read philosophy was in high school. I went to a Jesuit prep school that still had somewhat of a great books thing going on. Um, but you know, when you're like 15, 16, there's only so much of that you absorb. Um, and then I wanted to go to a school where there were no rules because, um, I'd been in Catholic school for so long. So I got my bachelor's at Bennington College, where you sort of build your own curriculum. I studied poetry and music recording. Um, and then a few years after college, I was uh, very broke, um, painfully broke. and um, <laughs> That's what happens sort of when you get a poetry what, degree. Yeah, yeah, right, right, exactly. <laughs> um, but, you know, I had a great resume. You know, I had done all these, like uh, – pretty solid internships and things like that. And I mean, I graduated in 2011 where that fall we added literally zero jobs to the economy. Right. Um, right. And so I did that. I was living on the poverty line for a few years and then I got the opportunity to not do that and write literature curriculum for a common core curriculum company, which was a nightmare, but paid really well. And that gave me enough time to read. And so the first thing I did was I read um, all of volume one of Marx's capital on my own. And because I wanted to know why uh, no bankers had gone to jail, right? And why I had been so broke. Um, and then I thought, you know, I could believe this and I do believe some of this, but I need to test it against everything else. So I decided to go get a master's at St. John's when my contract was up with that company. And I wanted to try and break whatever nascent Marxism I had, Um and now I don't know what I am. I know I still take Marx very seriously, but I take a lot of other thinkers seriously. Um, and I ended up falling in love with philosophy because it gave me more avenues with which to interrogate the world than I had um, when I just had aesthetics before that. And, uh, you know, based on your, your story made me think about my own journey into philosophy, which I will uh, elucidate on briefly. Um, I also studied engineering, but then uh, political science as well at MIT and uh, just stopped doing my engineering homework because mm -hmm. I loved the political thought stuff so much. And that was sort of my introduction. Uh, and then I just started reading like a maniac. After that, I was flying a lot. So I had plane time and 
got to crush um, a whole bunch, but it was totally unguided. Mm. And, you know, I, I, you know, I will make the case that I think a classical education is the most important way to learn how to be human, which is a sadly very much untaught uh, talent. And it doesn't know, pay very well. And it doesn't. Right. And it doesn't pay very well. So it's it's, you know, a tough case to say, you know, go to college and drop 200 grand on your philosophy degree. However, uh, I, you know, I think that this is one of the reasons that onlinegreatbooks.com is such a powerful resource because it allows people who have, you know, gone to school for job training to continue their education as an adult or, you know, as a young person in high school who's really curious about this, whatever, um, to continue their education into being human. And so, uh, you know, it's something I wish was around earlier for me to give me a little more guidance. And Xander, uh, you want to give a quick intro because not everyone here is a reconsider listener yet, but I'm sure they will be afterward. True. I got my degree in economics, although I also studied music as a double major. So I, I, I also graduated in one of the best times to find a job ever in U.S. history in 09. And as you can imagine, finding a job in finance in 09 was really easy and no, no difficulty at all. Um, but uh, I, I ended up leaving finance years later, and now I work at a geopolitical analysis firm. So I study things that have to do with politics that are sometimes directly, sometimes tangentially related to political philosophy, because a lot of times you have to ask the question, you know, why are the things happening like they are? What are the relationships? And you get kind of down to the basics issues of causation, what can be known, what can't be known at some point. So reading all of these things, all of these things has some direct degree of applicability to what I do at my job. And probably the piece of political philosophy that spoke to me the most first was Machiavelli, not The Prince, which everyone has read, although, you know, that's obviously an interesting piece too, but the discourses on Livy, which I, I don't actually think you can understand Machiavelli without reading the discourses on Livy because Without that, you don't really get the prince because the prince kind of slots into the the ideas that are laid out in that much longer work. So I I, I, I would say I really started reading po- political philosophy in earnest then, probably more recently than all of you. Hmm. So we have introduced our panel. As all listeners are at this point aware, Carl and Emmett are the experts on the topic. Uh, Xander and I are your friendly neighborhood amateur armchair philosophers. And uh, we will be speaking for you, dear listeners, who don't have your PhD in philosophy. Um, and we'll be asking Carl and Emmett the best questions we can and sharing what we love about the great books. So now to introduce our three philosophers. So I was tasked to pick the three philosophers, and I went with my gut. Um, They are not necessarily what I think are the most important philosophers ever, although they might be, and we can make that case if we want. Um, But I think they are three of the most influential, and I picked them spaced out over time, and I also have a political bent, so I was biased towards that. And our three philosophers in chronological order are one, drumroll, Plato, two, Machiavelli, and three, Mr. Karl Marx. All, uh, well, the latter two, you've heard their names already, and they also get a bad rap. So I'm particularly excited to unpack the two of them, but we have to go to the great wellspring of Western thought, the first big giant on the stage of philosophy and reason, Plato. Yeah, so I, I want to uh, actually dispute the no. thing about the expert. Oh, okay. uh, well, uh, I don't feel like an expert, okay? Uh, in philosophy, you do not get advanced books. You get in, an introduction to metaphysics, an introduction to political thought. You never get, like, higher level than that. It's, it's always an introduction, Um, and I think that that's part of what philosophy is. And if you want to know what philosophy is, you go back to Plato, you go back to Socrates. It's, it's hard to separate Socrates and Plato. The the Socrates we have is Plato's Socrates. Um, but they're the ones who invented philosophy. This thing that we do 
philosophy is their invention. People before, you know, Thales was was earlier than that, but I don't know that he was actually doing philosophy. Who knows what Heraclitus was doing or Parmenides for that matter. But um, th- this sort of uh, uh, discourse into finding meaning behind the appearances, this is Plato. And if you think about uh, what's, what's everyone remember from Socrates? What's his wisdom? What is the wisdom that Socrates has? Ooh, uh, my favorite is the unexamined life is not worth living. He asks a lot of questions on a really well, that's big a good one. level. Yeah, so let, that quote there, the unexamined life is not worth living. There's a, a, a two more words to that for a man. I guess it's three more words. Um, presumably it would be for a pig or a dog. But for a human, there's something different about us. We're the sorts of, of things that can examine our own lives. We're the, um, Emmett, what did Heidegger call it? It's the, the, we're the Dasein, the one that cares about its own being. Uh, it's, uh, nobody else does that. Um, but the one I was thinking of is my wisdom is his friend had gone to the oracle and said, is there anybody wiser than my friend Socrates? Can you ah, imagine yes. if, you had, if you had a friend like that, right? <laughs> so, my friends wiser? ask that all the time. <laughs> <laughs> anyone wiser than Eric? I yeah. have not. All right, found so, <laughs> all right, so Eric. So the, imagine that. <laughs> Could any dad be like my dad? Right. Well, imagine. <laughs> imagine there's actually an oracle that always tells the truth, and your friend goes to the oracle and says, "Is there anybody wiser than Eric?" And the answer is no. How do you react to that? Do you say uh, that's right? <laughs> I um, what I do is I put out a full page ad for my you know for my uh, new advice consulting business, <laughs> right? Your life coach, uh, but that wasn't Socrates's answer. He was well. I don't think I'm wiser than anybody else. Um, the only way that I'm wiser is that when I don't know something, I don't think that I know it. Whereas the politicians and the poets. Um, and everyone else that he asked questions to this whole story is recounted in the, in the apology. Uh, he would go and talk to these people, find out they didn't know what they thought they knew. And he knew he does. He, he knows when he doesn't know and they don't know when they don't know. So that's what philosophy is. Mm. If that makes any sense. Yeah. It's not uh, knowing what you don't know. I remember knowing that you don't know it. Yes. I remember reading Sophie's Choice. Or not, oh my gosh, not Sophie's Choice. Sophie's World, very different book. Uh, and <laughs> her interlocutor, whose name I now forget, said that uh, the bedrock of philosophy is curiosity. And as long as you are always curious, you are a philosopher. Right. Aristotle puts it, um, all philosophy begins in wonder. Mm. I love it. Yeah. And Heidegger has a nice thing where he's like, uh, yeah, the perfect philosophical mood is anxiety. Mm-hmm. Oh. <laughs> yeah. Gents, I want to ask a the broadest question first, and it is this. Plato died 2,400 years ago almost. And typically, things that people talked about 2,400 years ago, not always directly relevant. world was flat, four or five elements, that kind of thing. And we go, we've moved on as a society and we've learned and we've gotten smarter. At the risk of, you know, falling into the common trap of, oh, like ancient wisdom must be better because it's ancient, right? What makes Plato so worth reading today now that we've, you know, gotten so smart and and learned so much? Uh, Well, have we? Um in in the <laughs> we we've got bigger toys we've got better technology um but do we understand in 6000 years which is a blip of time it, it's nothing uh do we understand life any better you know um what am, what are, I, I can't remember those three questions that Kant asks what can i know i think it's something like what can i know what can i hope for how should i act um those are still live questions, right? Uh, or as Kierkegaard puts it, you know, Hegel can tell you everything in the world except what to do at four o'clock in the afternoon. Mm. 
<laughs> that does sound like Kierkegaard, doesn't it? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. He's he's pretty Socratic, actually. Um, so, you know, here I am living in a in 21st century America. How am I supposed to live? What am I supposed to do? What are the right things to do? How do you think about questions of right and wrong? Uh, you can't. It is unfortunate. Um, I feel like I'm name dropping now, but as, as David Hume points <laughs> out, you can't look through a microscope and figure out right and wrong. You're not going to see it there. So how do you figure out how to live? These are vital questions. So my, my dispute with the expert thing is another, another thing is uh, what we hope to do. What I hope to do at online great books is, uh, you know, these are books for everybody. These are books for, uh, not, you know, pointy headed academics. Um, although they should read them too, but they're for, they're for everybody. they uh, they were written for the public. Everybody's got a life to live. You know, nobody, and everybody has choices to make every single moment of that life. Right. 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 And so we've already, we've taken a few seminars, uh, through, I've taken a few seminars through Homer and, uh, um, you know, this stuff, it, it's it's 3,000 years old, roughly, and it still hits you right between the eyes. You know, I, I, I book six of the Iliad when, because I have little boys now, little boys and girls, uh, when Hector goes back and greets his wife and his child and tries to pick up his child and the kid cries because he's wearing his armor, man, that <laughs> that hits me. You know, uh, I don't think I've changed much and I'm not on the plains of Troy fighting Achilles or anything. And I hope never to be, but still I'm as human as he was. Mm -hmm. Emmett. So Carl, Carl tells us that the answers or the questions <clears throat> to how one should live one's life are not answered by modern science or, you know, our, our accumulation of knowledge. Now, here's the question. Does, do you think that Plato gives us the answer? I'm hesitant to, to talk about answers with Plato. I will say this. Mm. <laughs> it seems to be like there's a way of going forward, right? How does the Mino start out? We start out with, can you tell me, Socrates, you know, what is virtue? It starts with a challenge, right? Can you tell no, me? No, actually, it's can virtue be taught? That's what it is. Can virtue be taught? Yeah. It, virtue be taught. Is this a right? He doesn't even know the right question yet. Yeah, exactly. And what we get is an unfolding, right? This is what we do at online great, great books. We call it the, the dialectic, right? Where there's this overturning of ideas through conversation. So what you're doing is you're working with these things, with other people, trying to figure it out. Now, it's no surprise that we pull a lot of political ideas from that as well. Ideas like the demos, born in Greece, right? That there's a social common effort to figuring these things out. And that seems to be incredibly important for what we're talking about in terms of figuring out what the good life is, how to determine what to do at four o'clock on a Tuesday, you know? Um, and so I think what's being offered when I read Plato are chances to always reevaluate and reconsider ways to approach engaging with other people and our world is really rapid now. It wasn't always like that. So taking a minute to not be sure seems more important than making a decision immediately right now. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's right. Um, I, I like um, – do you know the dialogue, the euthyphro? I'm never sure if I'm pronouncing that right, but all the ancient Greeks are dead. So, Oh, boy. I have not read that one. They can't correct me. Uh, so Euthyphro is a young man who, who knows everything. Okay. He's, um, he knows what piety is. He's going in to prosecute his father on a charge of murder. And I have to tell you, I cast these people in my head. So can I tell you the casting that I do? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So for Socrates, I have Columbo. <laughs> <laughs> and for Euthyphro, I have Gaston from Beauty and the Beast. I know what piety is. Just ask me. You know, he's he's, he's very confident. 
and he's especially good at expectorating. He is good at expectorating, uh, <laughs> but uh, he he knows everything. Uh, just ask me, Socrates. I'll tell you. Uh, so Socrates asks him, uh, "You you must know a lot. Tell me what piety means." And so they go down a few rabbit holes. Are things pious because the gods love them? Well, the gods disagree. You know. Well, no, it's what all the gods agree on. Well, if it's what all the gods agree on, is it pious because the gods love it, or do they love it because it's pious? Which is a tricky little thing, but leads Ooh. into all sorts of theological problems and divine command theory and all sorts of ways that Euthyphro could have gone if he were a little more intelligent. He doesn't want to do that. Uh, and they go back and forth on this, and at the end, at the end, Euthyphro says, Ah, oh, look at the time. He doesn't actually say look at the time, but it's the ancient Greek equivalent. Uh, I must go. <laughs> Just when things are getting interesting, and I'm, I'm reading it, I'm like, yes, let's clarify ancient Greek theology, and do you really believe in all these gods? And if you do, are, are they really separate? Are these stories true? How are you to understand these gods? He doesn't want to do it. Or, or does he? But he stops. And so you're left with the question, does he continue his suit against his father? It's an ambiguous suit, whether it was actually murder or not. You know, What does he do? Now that he's had to stop and think that maybe he doesn't really know what piety is. Xander. So, like Emmett was saying, you stop and you think. Yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> Xander, you've read The Republic, right? Yes. Yes. So I have, I'm going to ask a leading question here. I have my own pet peeves about how people often think about The Republic. Um, and one of them is that, you know, one of them is that people will tell you, ah, yes, one of the things that Plato thought or Socrates thought, depending on who you ask, is mm -hmm. that we should form a society that's stratified by, you know, people of, of gold and uh, bronze and copper or something like that. And, and we should like build this feudal society and we should pretend that everyone emerged from the ground and, you know, didn't have parents and it was all just a dream. And, uh, you know, again, leading question is this how we should be interpreting Plato? Oh man, I I don't know. Uh, <laughs> I, don't, I don't have like a distinct answer to that. Uh, you know, Plato presents a couple of different forms of government that he says all societies pass through, um, and sort of the stratified society that you talk about is sort of a couple of different stages of that, right? Democracy and oligarchy, which are both ruled by the elite, but different types of elite. And that is, you know, certainly not a question left answered by him. It's something discussed by political philosophers in all ages to come. And I don't think there is an answer to should society be structured that way. It is the, the dialogue, the dialectic that a society undergoes in the public sphere trying to answer that question that results in how it's structured one way or another. Um, because... Uh, well, if you start getting into what is the right society, you start getting into is there absolute right or, or are we doomed to moral relativism and now we're at Carl Strauss and that's a whole different type of conversation we're going to have. So maybe it makes more sense for us instead of to say what is the right society, um, you know, is it the kind that is discussed in Plato? Maybe we should just talk about some of the different kinds of societies that Plato does talk about and the relevance for that today and then I suggest we turn that back to Carl and Emmett because they'll have it in more detail. Yes. And just to frame it up, one of the things I love in particular about Republic is that just as with the question, how do we teach virtue? Uh, it boils down to well, what the heck is it? And this, this is complicated and running around thinking, right. You know, running around thinking, Oh man, I, I know what virtue is. And, and so I should impose it on everyone is dangerous and in the Republic, the question of what is the right society boils down to the question, well, what is justice, right? What does it mean to, for, for people to sort of get what they deserve and, and uh, live the life they deserve? And, uh, you know, Emmett and Carl, what do you guys think about that particular discussion? Uh, I, I suppose I can go first. I, I, yeah, the Republic... When I think about it, I wonder if it's actually supposed to be a book of practical government. Uh, I I tend to think it isn't. Um, 
so your question was about about justice. Well, how do you know what virtue is? You have to know what justice is, but how do you know what justice is? Well, you've got to ascend through dialectic to have a vision of of the good, um, which is kind of magical, you know. Who could? It's either a gift for the gods, or you know, it's not going to happen. Uh, so the republic kind of gives and then takes back. It says, "This is what we would need to have a philosopher king." or philosopher queen. Uh, this is what we would need, somebody like this. But people like that could only arise if there were already a just society. But because there's not a just society, people like this can't arise except as a gift from the gods. You know, so it it's nothing that could ever actually happen. So I, I wonder if that's the purpose of it. You know, you shouldn't try to do impossible things, I think. <laughs> If something is set by the author as impossible, then probably it's not it's not what you're meant to do. So I like to think about it uh what's going on with the characters. So what's the the arc of the whole story? What's the point of a dialogue? I don't think dialogues are necessarily to give you positive doctrine. You know, we don't get any from the Euthyphro, we don't get any from Mino. Uh what so maybe we shouldn't think to get it from the Republic. If I I would, I try to be brief here. The the whole sketch of the thing, it starts with a fight with Thrasymachus over uh what justice is. And Thrasymachus is a is a very well, he's he's like the Machiavelli and the Prince. Uh justice is the will of the stronger. And uh whatever the strong want, that's what they get. And Socrates and his buddies don't like this answer and they want to try to fight it. And they manage to twist Thrasy- Thrasymachus up in the word games, but I don't think they've really won. The whole rest of the book is to show that being just is actually better than being unjust, even if you get no benefit from it, no worldly benefit from it. So that, you know, whether we're talking about a city or not, that that's beside the point. The point is whether justice is better. Um, so for me, there's something really funny in the middle, in the middle of the book. But there's a, a point where Socrates is ready to talk about different different types of government. And compare them to human souls. This is going to be fun. You know, what's a, de- what's a democratic guy like? What's a, a democratic guy like? And the, the young men, Glaucon and Adamantus, and um, I forget the other guys who were there, they say, wait a minute. Remember when you told us that all the wives are going to be in common? Remember all that sex stuff? We want to talk about the sex. This is like, this is in book five, I think. And they have to pause because... It's awesome dramatically because the characters in the book are not ready to ascend. They can't go up and get any better knowledge of the, of the good. So he has to stop. And then they have to talk about philosopher Kings and caves and, and gymnastic training in Crete and all of these things to try to convince them that they should love the good. And it's only after they love the good. And Glaucon says in the end, Oh, I wish that I, I could be like these people. What what beautiful people these are. That's when you can move up to justice. And so the actual nuts and bolts of the city are not, in my opinion, nearly as important as getting you to fall in love with wisdom. Mm. Now, Emmett, I think, you know, the since the truly underlying question here is what is the good? I want to ask you why that's an important question, in particular, because I think often if you walk around the street and you say, hey, what's good? What's the good life? People go, well, you know, just enjoying it. And, and, you know, and maybe it's something to do with accomplishment and maybe it's something to do with pleasure uh, and having a good time and like being happy. And the right society is the one where everyone's happy and we just make them happy. Um, And, you know, and it seems People are pretty confident about that. So what's the what's the thing we get out of reading Plato when, you know, Plato's Eric, Socrates I'm pretty sure the good that. life is Netflix and chill. Only way to be, dog. I'm pretty yeah. sure we figured it out already. <laughs> yeah, let's, let's yeah. go watch some Netflix and chill, um, bros. <laughs> yeah, so why is that still a salient question? Well, so we already have some interesting problems on the table, right? It seems like there's a tendency towards equating the good life with pleasure or something like it. And it seems like that's something that we ought to question. 
Why would that be? Is that even true? You know, what would we say about um, addicts, right? Who do the pleasurable thing until they kill pleasure. It's no longer pleasurable. So it looks like what's important about ask, trying to answer this question, trying to think through it, is that there are all sorts of uh, inherited assumptions that come with it that might not actually hold up. And I think one of the assumptions we're making when we do this is that there's something at stake in living a life, right? Because if there was nothing at stake, this question wouldn't matter at all. This is what's undergirding it. As we said earlier, you have to make so many choices throughout your entire life, right? And wanting to live some kind of fulfilling life is something that people seem to want to do or be able to do. I think it's very rare to find a true nihilist who really doesn't care. Except in the Big Lebowski. Yeah. Yeah. We are nihilists. We believe in nothing. I actually, I went through a, a brief like nihilistic crisis at some point in the middle of my reading, which I think might actually just be a necessary step in one's uh, growth, but maybe people have gotten to skip it. And I, looked back and I realized that nihilism is like not a choice you make. You don't go like, oh yeah, I'm going to believe in nothing. It's like a disease that hits you when you start questioning, when you question, well, why bother? Why do anything? Like, what is it? You know, is there any inherent good even in my pleasure and being happy? So what should I possibly do? And you stare into this void because there's not an answer. And I've, I, that period of my life was very tough, but I think very valuable. Yeah, I think that's right. So I have a, a comparison here um, to geometry. Uh, so you come out of your nihilism, right? I presume, since you're making podcasts and and yeah, uh, yeah, creating value and beauty. Uh, so you have to you got to figure it out. If you so the Pythagorean theorem, everyone can rattle it off. A squared plus B squared equals C squared. Okay, but do you know it? Is it yours? Do you have an insight into it? Or are you just remembering what was scrawled on the board in your classroom? Um, so there's a value, I think, in at some point in your life, uh, going through and, and proving the thing to yourself. Now you really know it. Now it's yours. So there you are in your nihilistic crisis and you're trying to figure out what should I do? Should I do anything? You know, uh, now you have to, to uh, you got to make a di- make a stand. Uh, I was reading something uh, in the first things a while back about the problem of critical thinking. That we teach critical thinking a lot, but we don't teach critical judgment. That because in the end you have to make a judgment. You, you're already in the game. You've got to make a move. So uh, what philosophy can do, I hope is help you figure that out. And it's not about me giving you answers. What do I know? You know, I, uh, uh, but uh, helping you, uh, you know, it's like Socrates was a midwife, helping you give birth to these ideas, helping you, you, you come to your own determination of how you ought to live. And we hope it's not, you know, as an ax murderer or something, but something that you've chosen that you understand the reasons for, uh, rather than just taking, rather than just doing what Oprah says. You know, so to uh, to keep you know to keep us from this six hour discussion, <clears throat> I want to start to I, I want to like wrap up Plato a little bit, which breaks my heart. Yes, um, and uh, launch a or take a take a stand on the answer to why we should read Plato. And for me, it has always been that Plato is the best question asker that I've ever read and maybe has ever lived and that challenging the assumptions that we have inherited about what is good, what is right, what is worthwhile is possibly the single most important step you can take in your growth as a person. Does anyone have other concluding thoughts on why we should read Plato? I'll say that what's, what's interesting about reading something that's, that's so old is you have what are a bunch of really intelligent people asking, you know, what was it? 
questions that were at the forefront of collective knowledge at the time, and this was in a pre-scientific time. So how did people go about asking questions about right and wrong and how to structure society when the idea of science, as an example, hadn't even been invented yet? And it's not the same process, right? Because that the process that they were creating would develop in time to become something known as philosophy and something known as science. So understanding that first is an interesting starting point for understanding how those ideas diverge later and what we can learn from that divergence. Carl and Emmett? It's fun. We should do things that are fun. Is it right? Or is it just pleasure? Or or is it both, as the Epicureans would say? Uh-huh. See, see, you're doing philosophy. You must philosophize uh, either... <laughs> because you have to know why you shouldn't. If you think you shouldn't do philosophy, you have to do philosophy to tell me why you shouldn't. So Whoa, there we go. meta. <laughs> yeah, no, but it's a great point. Yeah, I'm with Carl on this one. I think fun is the best hook to getting us started. Uh, because when you tell someone, hey, do you want to uproot everything you think you know and sit there and go, well, what next? Uh, they go, oh. Uh, no right yeah because it gets painful right yeah there's um uh slovenian philosopher uh now definitely in his winter um slavoj zizek and if you guys have ever seen the movie they live right where you put on the glasses and you can see the message mm-hmm. behind all the billboards or rowdy rowdy piper the main character gets in a street fight with this guy trying to make him wear the glasses and it's like an eight minute scene and Slavoj Žižek says, you know, that looks gratuitous, but if you really think about it, what he's asking this guy to do is to change his entire world. And that's so excruciatingly painful that, of course, someone's willing to be in a back alley street fight for eight minutes to stop it. Right? Hmm. I haven't seen that one. Well, to all of our masochist listeners, we've got a treat for you over at OnlineGreatBooks.com the true depth of pain in your soul of questioning <laughs> everything. And of course, uh, for the, the hook for those who have a bit of pride, I would say it takes great courage to philosophize. Sure. And it's fun. And it's fun. All right. Don't you Wait. like smashing stuff? Everybody likes breaking yeah, exactly. stuff, don't you? All right. Lightning round, uh, 30 seconds each. What's the book that we should read of Plato's that's not Republic? Carl Emmett, then Xander. Oh, shoot. Uh, you got to read the Apology. That, that's the one. Um, if you're just going to read one. Yeah. I cried. Legit. <laughs> yeah, me too. Uh, it's give, defense of his life, uh, trying to fight against uh, the shadows. Um, you'll despair of any politics ever after that, but then you'll figure it out. Yeah, go read that one. I'd pick the Symposium. I think that's a good hook. It's a good place to start for a lot of people who doesn't fall in love. That's what that's all about. It's good to take a look at. Read bits of the symposium, but I'll be real. I haven't read much other Plato aside from the Republic, so I don't have a recommendation for you. Uh, I'm I'm going to say symposium as well. Uh, it's my favorite kind of philosophy where a bunch of dudes get together, they get hammered on wine, and they say like, what is love, man? And have a great discussion about it. It's how we should, you know, it's actually how I want to run the next ConsiderCon or at least one day mm-hmm. of it. Yeah. And also, the symposium, just real quick, I want to make another brief plug for it. If we want to understand like the scope and in, like depth of influence these books have had on our everyday lives, right? There's this famous musical, which is also a movie called Hedwig and the Angry Inch. And I saw it when I was a teenager. I hadn't read the symposium yet. And in it, there's this story that Hedwig tells where people are born welded together, right? And then the gods split them in half and then they long for each other and love arises out of that longing. Fast forward like a decade and I'm reading the symposium and that's Aristophanes whole thing in the symposium. That's the story he tells. And that's the origin of love. I've seen Hedwig as well. (laughs) (laughs) All right. So, go read Plato. That's the conclusion. The next philosopher we have on our deck competing for space with, uh, you know, the first great is 
a slightly less prolific, but possibly just as important person. We will find out if Niccolo Machiavelli can uh, hold a torch to Plato. And Xander, I'm actually going to start with you because I know we've talked about this before. And this is a little bit more, you know, in in your uh, in your space. So Niccolo Machiavelli, Machiavellian, right? Super Machiavellian, terrible dude, you know, just just power, power, power. Uh, that's true, right? Right. Power, power, power. So Machiavelli would basically make a good spinning coach is what we're saying, <laughs> right? Just power through. It. <laughs> um, yeah, I think you you clearly set me up on purpose, right? Because my thing is, I don't think Machiavelli is a Machiavellian and that he's Oh, I had yeah. I had no idea you thought that. What a surprise! Yeah, I know, right? It's not like we work together or anything. Um, right? I don't think Plato's a Platonist. Wow. Okay. What? Mind blown. <laughs> I actually, I would super agree with you on that. Yes. So, Sander, uh, you know, you've you've read, uh, unlike unlike me and most of us, you've read both of Machiavelli's big works, Discourses and The Prince. And so, you know, you said Discourses is, is really impressive, probably something that not a lot of our listeners have gotten to read yet. So tell me, tell me, Xander, why is Discourses so worth reading? Yeah, and you know, honestly, those are not those are maybe two of his most well-known pieces, but he has other really important works too. And I haven't read all of those, but like the Florentine uh, commentaries or whatever they're called. Anyways, what's interesting about Machiavelli is, he was a, a practice diplomat, so he lived in, in the actual world of fractured late 15th century Italy when all of these warring city-states were just like at each other's throats trying to kill each other. It was anarchy, and he experienced that. And that is about the same time that the whole Renaissance thing was getting kicked off too, and people were beginning to remember the greatness of the Roman Republic and the Roman Empire. And people were kind of asking themselves like, well, it was really great. Like Italy was great. How do we make Italy great again? Um, <laughs> and what, what <laughs> well, hashtag me. Yeah, exactly. Right. So <laughs> a lot of the questions Machiavelli as, is asking in his works is how do we actually take our current society, which is quite anarchic and violent and and get back to where we were and machiavelli i don't think was i i don't think you could paraphrase him saying that he thought that he with power was just or power makes justice he was a republican he actually thought that the best form of society was a republic but he also realized that like plato societies go through periods of time when it is impossible to have the ideal form of society. And when you are in one of those less than ideal times, there are still better and worse ways to act. So if you are in a phase of social development, when your society can't be a republic, and maybe it's too chaotic and it requires a strong central leader in order to coalesce all of the different factions and all of the different city-states that currently exist into one entity in order for that to develop into an aristocracy, which he thought was a better form of government. Um, so you, you still need that strong man leader. You need that prince. And the point of the prince then is to say, okay, if, if society finds itself in this time, how do you be the, the most ideal version of that prince? And a lot of the answers that he comes up with in the prince are, okay, well, the best prince is not necessarily what we would say the best average citizen is. Those the, the things that make you a good person in society don't map perfectly onto being the best prince because sometimes a prince needs to do things that are necessarily seen as deleterious uh, in average life. And that's just how it is. And in fact, if you act like a normal or ordinary moral person should act as a prince, you will be a worse leader and create a more hazardous society, a more violent society, because you won't be able to consolidate that power as quickly as possible and therefore allow for the evolution into the republic that he wanted to bring Italy back towards. So I think Machiavelli is greatly misunderstood. I don't think he was a Machiavellian. I think he was often trying to be an objectivist when, and, and be descriptive when people were, were saying he was being prescriptive. And when he was being prescriptive, he was actually prescribing a republic and not a dictatorship. One of the things I love about Machiavelli is, uh, and I'm just being reminded now that I didn't pick Marcus Aurelius, and I'm heartbroken about that. 
but because he's my favorite philosopher. But one of the things I love about Machiavelli is knowing the context of the prince. And the prince was written to uh, the prince of Florence, maybe. Uh, and it was essentially a job application. Uh, Machiavelli had ticked a few people off. He'd been kicked out. And he said, look, man, I got to get back in the game. And he wrote his most famous work uh, actually as a, you know, guiding, you know, as a guidepost to someone on actually how to rule. And it, this therefore makes him just beautifully uh, competent and well, his experience makes him like beautifully competent in thinking about this and qualified. Um, and the fact that this was actually a letter to someone to, or a book for someone to read, to use, to rule means that he is, you know, just the the most, it's like the most practical work that you can imagine and like most applied directly. And I think that's really cool. Yeah, I is it's interesting. I actually I'm not sure if Machiavelli necessarily ticked people off, but there was some sort of overthrow of the government. And since he had been working with the prior administration, the new administration was doubtful of everyone associated with the old one. So I think he was subject to a purge. So he went from working in Florence to kind of like being just on his real estate and being like, now I gotta get back in the game. But anyways, now we're talking history, not philosophy. So yeah. Emmett and Carl, uh, anything, anything like inspiring you uh, about Machiavelli? Uh, so I, I was looking forward to the, to the rest of the podcast after we chatted about Plato because I don't know a great deal about Machiavelli or Marx and I want to know why I should read them. And, and I'm learning that I should and I'm excited. I want to hear what Emmett's got to say about Marx later. Uh, so I just jotted down a note. So the the prince is not necessarily good, according to maybe private morality. So uh, the, the the question that that raised for me is, I mean, we already had this in Plato, the, the noble lie. You know, can you tell a noble lie to mm. the citizens to make them better? Well, you have to figure out what better is. But so the rulers have a diff already have a different morality in the republic. Um, and I'm wondering if Machiavelli has something like that going on. Yeah, There's actually some, Oh, go I, ahead, Sander. I was going to say, yes, I think. And the example that Machiavelli always kind of like refers to in modern day times is Giulio Cesare. He just like, not Giulio Cesare. What am I talking about? Um, Giulio, Cesare and Borgia? uh, son of the Pope, son of the Pope. That was the, um, uh, yes, Borgia? Yeah, exactly. Borgia, Cesare Borgia. Um, Julio Cesare is Julius Caesar. Uh, great opera <laughs> by Handel, though, if you're into that sort of thing. Uh, <laughs> and uh, so for some reason, he just like loves Cesare Borgia. And he, I think he uses him as one example in, in, in The Prince where he's saying, okay, look, if you're a prince, one of your goals, like the reason you need to be a prince because you need to consolidate power. And consolidating power means eliminating opposition to your power. And so it's better to do that really quickly and definitively uh, rather than just kind of like be a nice guy because then other factions are just going to come back and challenge you and society is going to be pulled back into a violent tumult again. Now, the whole point is getting past that phase when you're in anarchy. So one of the prescriptions he has in The Prince is like, look, you need to be violent, but there's a correct way to be violent. And the correct way to be violent is to be hmm. uh, very visibly violent, um, but not to do it in excess, but to do it as quickly as possible. So do all of your purges, make them very public, and then stop and don't attack people who aren't your enemy. Only attack people that need to be eliminated so that you can consolidate power so that society can then evolve into a more peaceful phase. Yeah, I think, you know, if we want to understand Machiavelli in an important, because um, he's a moment, right? He is, you know, what I guess French philosopher Alain Badiou would call eventual. He's a capital E event in political philosophy. Um, so already in Plato with the Republic and uh, the laws, um, and then in Aristotle with the politics, um, and a whole bunch of you know other thinkers, medievalists that happen. Uh, there's a discussion of the regime. What is to be done with the regime? Are regimes stable? Um, what makes them stable? Right when we read Herodotus and Thucydides, especially Thucydides, there's uh, a lot of thought about this, and the Roman philosophers as well. Right, there's a reason it's discourses on Livy. Um, and it seemed to me like Machiavelli was very interested in what makes 
an enduring regime? And some of those answers on some sort of ethical level, we might not really like, you know, um, but is that the case? It might just be. And we should be asking those questions. And do we, should we, should we uh, evaluate people who have a lot of power uh, with a different rubric than the run of the mill citizen? Is that an appropriate thing to do? Or uh, do we want to have a more, as it's called, real politique outlook on it? I mean, I think these are very salient questions that we should be asking every day in our political lives. And whether or not we agree with Machiavelli, I think there's a lot of fertile ground there. The other reason I think that Machiavelli is super duper relevant today is an idea that he brought, I believe, from Plato, or at least expands on from Plato, which is, and you guys will correct me if it was Plato or Aristotle, but it was um, the evolution of governments, the cyclical evolution of governments from uh, one guy to a few guys to many folks making decisions. Was that originally Plato or Aristotle? Uh, I think it's in, I think it's in Republic. Um, Okay, great. Yeah, I think it's in Republic because Aristotle's too typological for that. Great. So what Machiavelli describes is this idea of essentially civic virtue. And the story goes like this. You, in a state of anarchy, you get a prince who is quite noble, who has strong civic virtue. And the people rally around that prince and consent to being ruled because that prince has protected them in some way, has given them a, you know, a national identity and a, um, you know, stability, essentially. And the idea is for a while, the princes rule justly, or at least as well as they can. They rule nobly because they have civic virtue. But over time, they start to forget and they start to essentially become selfish and they care more about using their power and their privilege for their own good rather than the good of the people. And then what happens is the other powerful people, the sort of aristocracy, overthrows them and they take up power. And because they remember the wickedness of the bad princes, for a while, they are just and they are noble. But over time, they too, you know, generations, they forget their own civic virtue and uh, they become corrupt and abusive and all this stuff. Uh, And then finally, what happens is the people get fed up with this. And they decide to overthrow the aristocrats. And finally, now power is in the hands of the people, which, of course, is in modern parlance, just the right way to do it, right? It's unquestioned that it's the right way to do it and always the right way to do it, Um, that, you know, the the people should rule themselves. But what, what happens next? Well, it's the same story. At the beginning, people remember the tyranny and they remember the evil of the aristocrats and perhaps the kings as well. And so for a while, there is civic uh, virtue among the people and they're thinking about the good of the nation as a whole. And they're thinking about, you know, what decisions should be made for the nation. But over time, they become, uh, they lose their virtue and they start becoming selfish and they start entering politics thinking, what can I or my own little group get out of this? And it becomes factionalized and breaks down until... It's such anarchy that they ask another king to take over and the cycle continues. And of course, there are, you can think of a, you know, some examples of this. Rome is perhaps a good example. And of course, today uh, in the United States, parts of Europe and other parts of the world, as we start to see, a, as we're seeing a breakdown of, you know, the, the kind of order and stability that we were used to and civility that we were used to in politics, we start asking ourselves, are we going down the same route as well? Yeah, I think what's interesting about Machiavelli is the typology. Uh, I mean, what you presented, Eric, is exactly the cycle that he discusses in Discourses on Livy, and he uses examples from Roman times to, at that at this point, contemporary Italian times to get there. But it's basically, you know, rule by a single person, rule by elite, rule by everyone. And then there's a virtuous and unvirtuous version of each, virtuous prince, unvirtuous tyrant, virtuous aristocracy, unvirtuous oligarchy, and then virtuous democracy and unvirtuous mob rule. Yes. And I think that the, the like crazy unpopular in modern society, 
because you know if we think of the end of history by what's his face what's his name Francis Fukuyama. There we go. Fukuyama. Thank you. Uh, if we think of End of History by Fukuyama, he was like, great, everything's going to be democracy and it'll be liberal and it'd be great. And that was like the source of, you know, neoconservatism uh, or like liberal foreign policy, which are surprisingly similar, uh, which is we should just make more democracies and it'll end war and everything would be great. And I think that it is worth challenging that notion. Any thoughts on that? Uh, yeah, I have some thoughts. I So the thing that keeps coming up is virtue, um, which, of course, we got to go back and figure out what it is. Yeah, uh, we still don't know. Yeah, so that's a thorny issue. And and to some extent, I don't know that it matters. I mean, I, obviously, I have some things that I think it is. But for from the standpoint of a state, what matters is that you have civic virtue that is um, durable that sticks around, that actually informs the leaders, uh, that, uh, uh, who was it that said about our constitution that it, that it only works if you have a good people, if you have a moral people might've been James Madison. Um, yes. And Ben Franklin, of course said, uh, when asked what kind of government they would have, he said a Republic, if you can keep it. Yeah. So this gets to, um, some culture stuff that's real important. Uh, which, you know, nobody wants to talk about because we, we, we don't want to think that any culture might be better than any other. Well, I think for a durable state, you might have to believe one is, you know, um, make believe, tell yourself some stories, tell your rulers some stories. Um, maybe they're even true, right? Uh, but a, a good prince does this and he doesn't do that. And uh, if you don't have that, that's one of the the paradoxes of um, the current state of things is, you know, we want to have liberal democracy and freedom without the belief system that undergirds liberal democracy and freedom. And so that that's worrisome to me. I'm not sure how yes. durable it is. Yes. And I think we have fooled ourselves into thinking that you know, the Republic is strong in the United States because of our legal system and because of the checks and balances and the structure behind it. And that has probably helped quite a bit because our founding fathers did, of course, learn from uh, many of the mistakes of the past. But uh, many such republics have fallen. France is on its fifth. And, um, you know, I think we're starting to find that these laws are really good when everyone decides to follow them. But when enough yeah. people stop respecting the institutions and stop respecting the laws, we find out that they are indeed paper. Yeah. Do you guys watch Game Too of Thrones me. at all? Oh, yeah. Do you remember the, spe- <laughs> Do you remember the speech, uh, the, the conversation between Littlefinger and Varys about uh, the stories that we tell? And, and Littlefinger's answer is, you know, Varys is like, we have to tell these stories. And even if we don't believe them, we have to tell them. We have to believe them or pretend we believe them for the sake of the people. And Littlefinger, he, he, he'll have none of that. And he's like, chaos is a ladder. You, know, you can find it on YouTube. It's, it's, it's uh, chilling. You know, if I, I mean, I don't want to I, – I think some things are true. But even if I'm wrong, I think we need to think that some things are true. Yes. I'm actually reminded of Terry Pratchett's Hogfather, which is not a book of philosophy, uh, but it's great fiction. And the thing I took away from it is that um, because it's all about like when you when it was a world in which like when people believed in these like little gods, they they became real. Um, and uh, my favorite example is the O oh God of Hangovers. And uh, because you pray to him when you're over the toilet, you're like, oh, God. Um, but the idea behind it was that we need to be able to believe in things that we cannot necessarily see and touch in order to believe in the bigger things like justice and fairness and right. Yeah, I, I think that's right. Mm. All right. Any last thoughts on Machiavelli besides go read them? Excellent. Good. So. Machiave- yeah, one of the things about Machiavelli and our next great philosopher, Mr. Karl Marx, with his big bushy beard, is that they were a little less about saying, 
hey, let's just question everything. And they wrote less in a dialectical style that was just unpacking stuff and showing how little we know. They were doing a little bit more of trying to, you know, give us some answers. And there's value in that. Um, And putting it, and it's one of the reasons I think that it's so important to read more than one of these is that you have to have these kind of competing things going and, you know, having Plato's questioning everything, questioning what is good, what is virtuous, guides you in and, and makes you think more when you read someone telling you what they think is good and virtuous. You go, hmm, well, and it helps you, you know, it helps you think rather than just consume. Anyway, we move on to Karl Marx, who had some pretty strong opinions about how society should be run. Emmett, why should we read Mr. Karl Marx? Yeah, I, you know, um, actually, I don't know how strong his opinions were about how it ought to be run. I think anybody who wants to indict Marx for not expanding on the idea of communism is going to have a lot of uh, leeway to do that successfully. Um, But what I'd like to start with is just a simple question. Um, Beleaguered and uh, disappearing as it is, one question we might want to ask ourselves is why is the work day eight hours and five? And why is the work week five days? Right? Why did that happen? That's not, that hasn't always been the case, right? I mean, it was May Day not too long ago, um, which is a big celebration of a lot of workers' wins. And Marx has a whole chapter in Capital Volume 1 where he's going to talk about the fight over the working day. And he's essentially going to say this. You come into the market as a worker, and you have to sell your labor to stay alive. That's the commodity you bring to be bought on the market. Well, your boss is going to buy that. But in doing so, now there's a conflict because your boss is going to want to get as much out of you as possible while paying you as little as he can, right? And when Marx is writing uh, in the mid-19th century, the dawn of the factory system, this is pretty apparent, right? Right? up in where we call it the West now or the global North, whatever we want to call it. That's still kind of apparent, but not necessarily, you know, but just go to where we buy our clothes from and you'll see that that's still pretty much how things work. Right. Uh, and the worker is going to have a vested interest in trying to do basically as little as possible and get as much money as possible. Right. Because it serves their best interest as someone bringing something to bear on the market. Well, what do we do with that? That seems like this liberal democratic society, this capitalist liberal democratic society that we've made, uh, looks a lot more like a kind of civil war by other means, right? Like, how is it possible that somebody like Jeff Bezos has, you know, however many billions of dollars and many of his workers have to apply for food stamps? And in fact, Amazon has installed workers to go amongst the workers and help them apply for food stamps. That seems strange. And earlier we were talking about political atrophy and things like that um, and how things have become corrupted, right? That there's sort of a death of civic virtue, that uh, it seems like uh, money is really the thing that moves everything and not these civic virtues, and that that's the way society pans out. Now, that's essentially going to be part of Marx's very lengthy arguments about these things, which changed a lot over his life. So if you have some fundamental questions about your workday or the one of the most important political questions, cui bono, who benefits, he's an interesting person to read. He has a lot of what I would argue are salient things to say about how our society ended up in the place that it's in. I mentioned that Machiavelli and Marx both take some flack. And I think one of the reasons I wanted to uh, you know, bring them up is to give them an opportunity to stand beyond the one-liners of, you know, of, of common parlance about them from people who probably haven't read them. Marx, of course, uh, gets a lot of flack because the communist experiments of the 20th century – were so disastrous and destructive Mm -hmm. to human life. And one of the things 
that I think we need to do to give them a fair shake is say, you know, what was the what was the gap between what Marx believed and what ended up happening? Um, and and I mean, maybe it's not as big as you know I hope, and and we can give them some flack, but you know, ultimately, uh, where did you know, where did the 20th century diverge from the ideas of Marx to become such a train wreck? Right. I think that's an interesting question and one we should spend a lot of time pondering. You know, um, how would I put it? You know, we said earlier that Plato, you know, likely wasn't a Platonist. I don't think Marx was a Stalinist. You know what I mean? Like these guys had their own ideologies and their own ideas. It, I think it's actually really hard to indict the teacher for the student. Otherwise, we shouldn't read Plato because of what a train wreck Alcibiades ended up being. <laughs> <laughs> he did, didn't he? That's right. That's you know, right. Um, so that, that's something. Since we're on Alcibiades, the other book I recommend everyone read that is a great book is indeed Thucydides, The History of the Peloponnesian War, uh, after reading Alcibiades 1 and 2. Uh, and, and we actually get to see how I, the train wreck that Alcibiades became. Yeah, just – yeah. yeah. He was just he was absolutely horrible. And look, like one of the things that we might want to look at is uh, let's talk about some of Marx's argumentation, right? So in order to do what he would call communism, right? And so there are a couple ways to think about this. And uh, this is hotly debated uh, in these circles. But um, I'm going to look at two, right? And one is that, you know, we have enough to go around, so it should go around, Right. But before you can even do that, there has to be enough first, right? And so Marx was actually very interested in a lot of the great things capitalism brought to bear. He was a hardcore free trade uh, guy, right? Hmm. Um, and he thought that cal- capitalism was doing a great job of producing all of these things that could then be spread amongst everybody. And then another way to think about it is, again, the working day. Right now we have this idea that there's work and then there's everything else you do with the rest of your life. Well, one way to think about communism and say, what if there is the rest of your life and then the bare minimum of work you had to do to make sure that was possible? Right? So falling in love, making art, you know, designing a building, whatever, whatever, all these things. Uh, conducting an orchestra, perhaps, uh, are what's the focus of life. Now, again, you're going to need enough to do that. When you look at Russia at the turn of the 20th century, it is extremely not good <laughs> in terms of there being enough, right? Yeah, famine's all over, yeah, famine's all over, all over the, place. the place. Um, it's not an industrialized society. It's, in fact, incredibly backward in a lot of ways. Um, Russia then, as now, is kind of fractious um, and is a strange federation of recondite provinces, uh, many of which don't speak the same language necessarily, right? And the Russian Revolution was an urban revolution. It was minoritarian, right? So when you put all these things together and then you put it in the context of what else is going on in the world, World War I, where all these are incursions on Russia's border, you know, and when you do a revolution, you know, as we were talking about with Machiavelli, there are a lot of people that are like very butthurt that you have done a revolution <laughs> and they want their power back. So you're going to have to consult. Right. You have taken, you've, you've taken right. it away from the people who had right. it and, and they so had it pretty good. I think the best way to understand where these mistakes were made is to actually historically contextualize them. And there's a Marxist way to do that. And most Marxists I know it's aside from a few absolute like psychos uh, condemn what happens under the USSR, you know, you get that great like five year period in the twenties or whatever. Uh, and then it's, you know, nightmarish. Right. So you mean after all the killing and before all the other killing? Yeah, exactly. Much like our revolution, yeah. you know, um, all the killing, all the tarring, all the torturing, uh, and all the genocide and slavery that continues before and after. One of the things that I found really interesting about reading Marx was, getting beyond just his economic ideas because, you know, obviously he introduced a new way of thinking about what is a just economy. Yes. Um, or a just, you know, a new way of, of, 
of organizing a society in a more just way, which of course reaches all the way back to, you know, Machiavelli to some extent and Plato to a huge extent that we need to challenge that just the way things are doesn't mean it's the way things should be. Um, but the other thing I really appreciate about learning Marx that teaches us a lot about today, um, cause there's some things, as you mentioned, Emmett, that cause us to question modern society, but I think he can help us understand modern society through how he influenced it. And I think the biggest example was through thinking about the emergence of class consciousness and how that affected, how classes affected history, he essentially came up with what we call mm-hmm. historical materialism. And, uh, you know, so to some extent, that is just like kind of implicitly accepted in many academic circles. So when you learn about history now in high school or college, you're essentially typically learning a historical materialist bend to it. And so Marx has influenced the way we think about history and view it through a brand new lens. Um, and I think that, you know, helps us like, I think understanding that by reading him helps us put into context what we're learning in school. The other thing that I think is really interesting, and I invite your guys' thoughts on it, is I happen to believe that um, Marxist, the Marxist approach to sort of group-on-group struggle, and he focused primarily on economic classes, um, but essentially it focused on, but essentially like it can be extrapolated to the oppressed against the oppressors. And so I think that this is a that Marx is a basis of a lot of the liberation movements that occurred um, throughout the 19th and 20th centuries. So, for example, women's suffrage, the civil rights movement in the United States, um, and also deeply influences how a lot of people think about social justice today. Right. It's very different from the liberal idea where, you know, if you think of um, uh, mm-hmm. oh my gosh, what's his name? Locke or someone like that, you know, the ideal was just equality under the law. And the social justice movement now says, no, 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 it's way more complicated than that, right? It's, it's very, you know, there's way more going on to create a just, you know, e- even, even free society. And, uh, you know, I want to get your guys' thoughts on whether my interpretation is right and, uh, you know, expand on it. Go. <laughs> Uh, what well, that's clearly true. Um, the, uh, so I, that seems to be a, like a permanent feature of, so I'm, I'm not super familiar with Marx, so I'm, I'm reacting to it. And it seems a permanent feature of our discourse is, is the notion of conflict, um, between, uh, you know, classes between, uh, between workers and owners and, so this is a, I think it's even getting very fractious right now. It's uh, for those of you who are thinking of coming to online great books, we actually have a rule, no politics. <laughs> so uh, you can talk about politics a hundred years ago, but you can't talk about it now uh, because we don't want people to hate each other. I, yeah. By the you way, know? just to say, it's I good rule. <laughs> agree with that rule when we're in seminar, you know? Oh yeah. Yeah. It's uh. so, but here we're going to talk a little bit about it, I guess, but but you know, but the reason for the rule is because we've gotten very much us against them. It's it's it's, and so I was jotting down my notes, listening to the the talk about Marx, uh, who sounds really really interesting, and I'm going to dig into it. But does it have to be war? You know, is there a way out of class conflict so that we can have what I'd consider a civil society? Uh, he must have something on that, right? So after the revolution, what do you do? Is that a good question? I think that's a great question. I mean, obviously, oh, we're going to need some question. institutions and stuff like this. Like I said, if you want to indict Marx for not prefiguring uh, enough of communism, you'd be right. You know, I also I'm not 100 percent sure that was his actual project. I think Marx was very interested in having a kind of philosophical, almost anthropological, anthropological analysis of how things worked as at the moment he was writing them, right? I think that was that's what he was going for. Um, but yeah, I think this question, what do we do with faction, right, is the question here, right, conflict. Um, and it's not like we've mentioned our founding fathers. They weren't hip to that being a problem. That's Federalist 10. 
the biggest factions in a society are those between debtors and the people they owe money and those who have property and those who don't, you know? So they wanted to come up with a system of ventilations. Uh, they could make it workable, you know, and, you know, some people didn't really count as people yet. So there are some problems there. Um, but I think that while Marxism might have some sort of departure from what a lot of people would call bourgeois morals, right? Um, bourgeois law, things like that, sort of this Lockean conception, uh, that uncomfortably for a lot of them, their concerns are going to be very similar if you want to make a society, you know, um, one of the things we might say is that for a Marxist, you might say, sure, equality under the law is important, but you can't have equality under the law without a kind of material equality for every citizen. That doesn't mean 100%. Right. I believe it was Oscar, I believe it was Oscar Wilde that uh, lampooned or criticized, and, and I may be wrong about this, but criticized the liberal notion of equality under the law by saying that, ah, yes – both the rich man and the beggar are equally unallowed to sleep under the bridge. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that sounds like Oscar Wilde. So I'd be very comfortable with giving that one to him. Um, yeah. I think the thing about Marx that's way more important than, um, you know, than the specific economic structure that, you know, structuring that came out of his thinking is his, lens on history that, um, as Thucydides put it, not that he thought this was good, the strong mm -hmm. take what they can and the weak suffer what they must. And he said, look, this has been like, this has been the, the path of history. And when we're thinking about justice, you know, if you, if you like buy into that interpretation of history, I think most of us would, would at least intuitively, and we always have to question it, but intuitively say, well, that doesn't feel right. Right. And so Mark tries to give an answer, or at least part of an answer, but he opens up the question of, well, how the heck do we possibly change that? Right. Because we can't just let things be the way they are. And in particular, the people who have the power to shape society want to hold on to it. So we can't depend on them to do it. Yeah. I mean, you know, it's true with um, any revolution uh, that has sort of a populist bent to it or something like that, or a more democratic been like the American revolution, right? You know, um, keep it in the past. Um, you know, nobody's going to give it to you. You got to take it. It's very rare that you're going to get somebody in whom power is consolidated. Uh, then they're just going to say, you want to know what, man, you're right. Checkmate. Here's all your rights, you know, and that's one of the harsh realities of this. You know, when we're talking about Marxist history, one of the things that I find really interesting, and I don't know if it's true, but I find it very interesting, um, is we were talking earlier about Francis Fukuyama and this end of history. You know, no more events, no more capital E events. It's all just going to be technocratic uh, maneuvering within the liberal democratic system, you know, forever. Uh, Marx is going to say, you know, all of human history up until this point has been class war. You know, by all, he doesn't really mean all of everything forever. Um, but the main things are, uh, and he says, you know, if we can get past this, if we can live in a society where we can share in common, then that's the beginning of human history. Ooh, I like that. Because what would we do next? What things could we be capable of? And when we're talking about these dreams of a civic society, and I think that we have share a lot of common values here, um, that there is some sort of fellow feeling that there is some sort of solidarity and commitment that there is involvement, you know, I wonder, you know, what happens next? And we're talking about philosophy, wonder being a good situation for philosophy. I think that's a good question to ask. And I think people are free and should disagree with Marx as violently as they need to, but that remains a salient question. What would we do? What might come next? How ought we go forward? I, I think once we achieve a, a world of peace and the end of time defined by technocratic maneuvering, clearly the thing that comes next is finding people on other planets to kill. And then we start all over again. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> 
Well, and there's there's actually I think the I think the biggest criticism I have of Marx, besides possibly his his right. formulation of uh, of like oh this communism thing will totally work, um, is that he is that he I think was possibly was like unwilling to consider this idea of uh, like human nature as tribal. And, you know, if we look to our evolutionary history, um, you know, we, we existed in these tribes and we fought each other and, and that's what survived. Uh, and it's a little bit of that, you know, those with power take what they can and those without suffer what they must. But, um, you know, is it ingrained in human nature to, among all of, of human people, pick your group and have an enemy group? And is that inevitable for us? And the best um, illustrative example I've ever seen of this, mm. uh, of this question, is actually from the graphic novel Watchmen, um, also the, the movie in which, you know, the United States and Russia, the Soviet Union are about to go to nuclear war. And uh, spoiler alert for those who uh, haven't read it and want to skip the next 15 seconds. But so <clears throat> go ahead. Great. So, um, so Ozymandias, he creates in the book a monster and, and in the movie he frames Dr. Manhattan as an existential threat to all humanity uh, and actually kills a lot of people doing it and thereby is like able to unite humanity because they have a common enemy. Those of you who have skipped forward, you can now continue. Uh, anyway, any thoughts on that human nature thing and how it may or may not conflict with Marx? Oh, yeah, absolutely. And this is where Marx gets downright Socratic. When people want to press him with the human nature question, he says, well, what's that? What is human nature? Where did it come from? Has it been true for all of time? Have people always behaved absolutely the same? Um, yeah, no, that's a, that's an interesting question. I think maybe, I don't want to say more interesting, but it's hard to settle questions like that. And yet there there are cases where more data gives you a fuller perspective of maybe how to answer those sorts of questions. And for a long, long time, the the question of, you know, whether man is more peaceful in his natural state, the noble savage versus needing some sort of authority to compel action one way or another was outstanding. I don't think it's as outstanding anymore. I think there's really a lot of data that shows that that man without some sort of centralized authority is more violent statistically. And I I always refer to this book because it's like probably one of, if not the best books I've ever read, just in terms of the data it presents and how. And it's Pinker's Better Angels of Our Nature. And he presents like all of the different research that's been done, at least on a summary level, on on violence over time. And he makes an extremely compelling case that while it's difficult to know all aspects of human nature, uh, it is tribal. And when those tribes are small, they are all fighting each other. But if you can get some sort of sovereign in the style of Hobbes with a monopoly on, on violence, at least to a degree that could compel action, that, that violence decreases. doesn't disappear, but it decreases as a rate. Sure. Yes. And I think one of the ways that ties into Marx is, you know, if we think of Hobbes that, uh, you know, without a government, without a Leviathan, with a vi uh, monopoly on violence, uh, life is, uh, I always forget the first half, nasty, nasty brutish and short. Nasty, brutish and, short. Um, and, and Pinker sort of uh, validates this with data. And so it's, you know, one of the, one of the things that you can give to Marx if you're being generous is this idea that, well, human, like human nature, we, we respond to incentives. And when the world around us is dangerous, we gather up guns and build walls. Or when we feel it's dangerous, when we feel under threat, when we feel like there's not enough um, and, and that our, our security is at risk, we are, we're violent and, and, you know, selfish and have these small tribes. And when there's a structure that guarantees more safety. Uh, we tend to be more peaceful and, and we're better neighbors, right? We we're more willing to like each other and trust strangers. And perhaps, perhaps there is a world where if we create the structures where everyone can have enough and uh, that there's, you know, that there's less anxiety about having enough, 
then perhaps there is more space for this world that requires people to voluntarily share. Yeah. And I would also say this, you know, um, uh, there are things I agree with Pinker on and uh, disagree with him on. Um, you know, I'm not, I'm going to table that for now, but what I will say is, you know, it's important to realize that historically Marx was not a utopian, right? Guys like Proudhon were who he roasted like savagely because Proudhon was just like, Oh, all men are brothers, you know, like go forward into that great future of us holding hands. Mark was like, what does that even mean? What do you mean by that? Is that even true? So Marx was well aware of the idea that there are propensities towards guile and things like that. And that power probably wasn't going anywhere. There's always going to be power. But I think, you know, right now it feels like for wondering why we should read these books, why we should read Plato, read Plato to reconsider your whole life, which you should do. It's fun and it's difficult. Machiavelli has the salient questions of what makes a stable regime. How does that happen? What standards do we use to evaluate power? And Marx, when we're at this moment, it feels like there's been a death of the future. And we need to do some thinking about what a future might look like. There are some crises coming down the pike right now. They're pretty big. And we might need to start thinking about what it's going to look like to provide for everyone, you know, or how we're going to provide or how we're going to endure, right? Whether you agree with him or not. Because an ethical alternative, quote unquote, ethical alternative, is that um, if we buy into the dark world, then it behooves you to start picking who dies first. I don't think anybody on this call right now wants to do that. No, no, I don't want to. Uh, <laughs> hey, Eric, so I got a question. You brought up Watchmen. Should we do another spoiler alert? Uh, how does it end? Uh Dr. Manhattan leaves for another galaxy and Rorschach dies. Uh, what part am I missing? But before he dies, what does he do? What happens to his notebook? Oh, I forget what happens to his notebook. I remember he gets blown up because he's right. the moral absolutist. He, he, he's the moral absolutist. Um, <laughs> and he's my favorite character. Um, so you can draw your conclusions from that. But... <laughs> <laughs> he uh, he takes his notebook where he's written down everything that they've done and he flings it into this. Oh, right. This right wing, like really right wing, like like uh, newspaper fringe Idaho. Yeah. Because um, the truth's got to get out, he thinks. And so uh, if we were going to have so I'm thinking I'm listening to all this uh, about Stephen Pinker. If we were going to have. Um, a monopoly on violence and it's going to make everything better. Um, I wonder if you can sweep nature out, out of the door and it's not going to come back through the window. I think that's a French proverb, which is a difficulty. Mm. Uh, people are going to be mad at the things that are done to make the great society. They're going to be mad at Ozymandias if they ever find out, you know, and they probably will. Um, it's it's we get I'm looking at my copy of the Orestia. And we have the same kind of thing way back. And the, the ancients had this notion of the Furies. So you had very rational mm -hmm. Athenian, um, you know, we're going to make everything right. We're going to have new gods and new laws. And the Furies are in the background saying, yeah, but Orestes killed his mom. You know, there's got to be blood for this, uh, which to me, that's like human nature creeping back in uh, to the to our attempts to, to make everything great, you know, that, that somebody's going to want to blow it up because of some primordial injustice, which is probably there. Or is it just because human beings like blowing shit up and it's in their nature? We do. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. All right. We have, we have reached uh, 90 minutes and I promised people we would not be here for six <laughs> hours and uh, so, and, and God, this has been, this has been wonderful. So first, obviously, thank you so much, Carl and Emmett. Um, we've, you know, I, I, I really think we've, we've accomplished our aim, which is to, which is to like make a compelling case why this stuff should be read. And hopefully dear listeners, what you've gotten out of this is that one, there's a whole lot of assumptions that we all have about the world, what should be, how we should live, who we are, that are worth reconsidering and worth challenging. Mm 
And I think the other one is this. Just by doing you know, the briefest skim of each of these three philosophers, we have found – um, we have found like some threads that are very similar, right? They kind of they ask a lot of the same questions, and we found some you know so many different ways of looking at them and different lenses. Um, and when you're in you know when you know about Plato and Aristotle and Machiavelli, it informs how you're going to read Marx and vice versa. And so you know I think one of the most important things about when you're considering getting your classical education is that at these, these books are so much more powerful as a group. Um, they're so much more powerful, uh, you know, when, when you've, the more you read, the more you get out of each subsequent one. And they're so much more powerful when you get to talk about them with people and, and you know, he, hear some, you know, get questions thrown at you and ask questions and then walk away with those questions and let them boil and marinate. Uh, so, you know, obviously final plug here for, uh, onlinegreatbooks.com because um, it's such a, I think it's such a needed service because it's such a great way to be able to do that um, when you don't have the luxury of being able to go, you know, back to university um, and, you know, spend four years doing it. So, uh, you know, obviously, guys, it's been an absolute pleasure. I love what you're doing, um, you know, in the world and that you're bringing it to the world. So uh, thank you. And uh, any, any last comments? Uh, I'll start with Xander. Final thoughts. Uh, philosophy is good. It makes you think stuff. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. Emmett, closing thought? Um, yeah. I just want to plug the Socratic method because we talked about that before, and I think that's how we run our seminars. You know, We've talked about a lot of different things here, a lot of different ideologies, a lot of different ways of approaching the world. And what I love about how we do seminar – is that it puts you in a position where you have to decide for yourself. And that's something that you must do. These books are truly great. They have shaped and informed the way we live today, whether we like it or not. And some of it we might not like, but it's our duty to avail ourselves of what they contain. And it's like at the end of Rilke's sonnet um, on the torso of Apollo, right? There is no place that does not see you. You must change your own life. And that's what we offer here. Wow. I like that. Uh, so Emmett was pointing out the, uh, the debt that the eight day, the eight hour work day owes to Marx. Uh, and I'm fully willing to concede that uh, joyfully. So now that you've got an eight hour work day, all of you out there in podcast land, what are you going to do when you get home? You should read some books and talk to us about it. You know, please do. Yeah, and uh, we've got some uh, we've got some stuff for uh, you guys for your listeners, right? We've got a discount code which is REC, and you guys can go to intellectuallinearprogression dot com slash REC to join us, yep. and you'll get twenty five percent off the first three months. Yep. No, we are shifting the domain name. It's going to be online great books. Oh yeah, sorry. But intellectual LP will work as well. Uh, so yeah, we're happy to have you come and sign up. Onlinegreatbooks.com slash REC. Get your discount code and join and have more conversations like this. And the last plug that I would be remiss to make is that, of course, Xander and I, being so influenced by these great works and great philosophers, uh, decided that our gift to the world would be helping people reconsider politics today that they face. Um, you know, and, and all these works are behind everything we talk about. And those of you who have read it know it. Um, so if you're, if you want to do a little bit of applied political theory on what you're facing in the newsreel and get past the, you know, 140 character sound bites, um, then, you know, come check out Reconsider, where we don't do the thinking for you, uh, available where all great podcasts are found, hopefully. And, uh, yeah, we hope to see you there. We love comments, so come chat with us too. And with that, ladies and gents, you've got a lot of reading ahead of you, a lot of listening ahead of you. Let's go get to work. Go learn about yourself. Go learn about the world. Go learn about what could be. Yeah, and get to it.
So that was the show that Emmett and Carl recorded the Reconsider podcast, guys. Thanks, Eric. Thanks, Xander, for recording that and letting us uh, release that here. Please go to iTunes. Give us five stars and comment. It's a big help to us. Uh, Subscribe if you haven't, and tell a friend about our show and tell a friend about our program. It's important to us that more and more people read the great books. Thanks for listening. Thanks for listening.